G'day, this is Chris Savage from RL Ministries in Australia, welcoming you to this session of the Book of Ezekiel. I pray that it will be of benefit to you and help you in your Christian growth. Thank you for coming along. So thank you for coming along. In this session, we're looking at session 23 in the Book of Ezekiel. We're going to be traveling from uh, chapter 9, verse 17, down to chapter 31, verse 9. Let's uh, let's get into it. Now, this is the, uh, the invasion by the king of Babylon, Nebuchadnezzar, which we're going to look at from verses 17 to 21. The date that this is happening, it came to pass in the 7th and 20th year, in the first month, in the first day of the month, word of Jehovah came on to me saying, this is unto Ezekiel. So now in verse 17, where he talks about the 27th year, the date is according to the captivity of Jehoiakim, remember? Uh, normally when Ezekiel gives us a date for receiving his oracles, it is recording that it's according to the number of years that he has been in captivity with his king, Jehoiakim. So this would make it around about 571 or 570 BC. The first month could be either, either Nisan or Tishri. Most likely it's the month of Nisan, which would make it around March, April. If it's Tishri, then it would be around September, October. But it's, it, but it's more, more likely around uh, Nisan, March, April. So then in the first day of the month, the word of Jehovah came unto me. Uh, Dr. Fruchtenbaum would say that this prophecy came on the first day of Nisan in the year 571, which would make it 15 years after the destruction of Jerusalem. It would also bring us to the end of Nebuchadnezzar's 13-year siege of the city of Tyre, which we talked about when studying the oracles against Tyre last, last time. So after giving us the date in verses 18 to 20, Ezekiel now deals with Nebuchadnezzar's plunder of Egypt. Son of man, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, caused his army to serve a great service against Tyre. Every head was made bald and every shoulder was worn. Yet he had no wages, nor his army, from Tyre, for the service that he had served against it. Therefore, thus says the Lord Jehovah, Behold, I will give the land of Egypt unto Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, and he shall carry off her multitude and take her spoil and take her prey. And it shall be the wages for his army. I have given him the land of Egypt as his recompense for which he served, because they wrought for me, saith the Lord Jehovah. Yeah, in, uh, here in verse 18, Ezekiel tells us first about uh, Nebuchadnezzar's work at Tyre. He says he caused his army to serve a great service against Tyre. Now, Nebuchadnezzar did indeed destroy the coastal city of Tyre. And that is the great service he's being commended for by God himself here. Nebuchadnezzar's great service on God's behalf was the destruction of coastal Tyre. Now, son of man, uh, sorry, and so we see the plunder of Egypt and say, so by doing so, he accomplished God's will against that city. But this can't be at only after, uh, let's turn my phones off here, sorry. <laughs> now, uh, but this came about only after a lengthy siege of about 13 years from 585 until 572 BC. So now after the 13 years of siege, there was not a lot of spoil left in the city. And so there was insufficient plunder to pay for all of the expenses of sustaining the siege. It would appear that uh, the coastal city it would appear that they'd got rid of most of their, uh, their, their wealth out by sea. And so Ezekiel says that every head was made bald and every shoulder was worn, yet he had no wages nor his army. The picture of heads uh, rubbed bare was because of the prolonged wearing of the helmets and of shoulders that were raw from carrying wood and stone for building siege mounds against uh, the city. So that's why we have uh, heads bald and uh, shoulders worn. What God is saying here through Ezekiel is, although Nebuchadnezzar had done the great work I wanted him to do in the siege and subsequent destruction of coastal Tyre, yet he has not received sufficient wages for serving me against Tyre. So Nebuchadnezzar needed money to pay his soldiers for their labor, so he now turned to Egypt. 
So God uh, intend, now intends to give him the spoils of Egypt. So this would not only cover the Babylonians' expenses for the siege of Tyre, but also for the war against the land of Egypt. And as a result, uh, both Nebuchadnezzar and Babylon would be well recompensed. In verses 19 to 20, he spells out the payment to Nebuchadnezzar. In verse 19, he says, Egypt is to be a spoil. Therefore, because of verse 18, where Babylon had not been sufficiently repaid for the work of Tyre, thus says the Lord Jehovah. Here comes a new declaration now. Behold, I will give the land of Egypt with all her multitudes. So, yeah, uh, the multitudes, of course, were the Egyptian population. Uh, and so Egyptians would now be taken into captivity to become slaves in Babylon. So Nebuchadnezzar uh, has been given by God Egypt to take his spoil. He'll take her spoil and take her prey. And this will be the wages for his army, a salary earned from God for the 13-year siege of Tyre. So first up we see is that Egypt is to become spoil. Then second, in verse 20, Egypt is to become a recompense. I have given him the land of Egypt as a recompense for which he served. Again, this is a, this is a reference to his... Uh, great service of verse 18 in the, in destroying coastal Tyre. Now notice how verse 20 ends. They wrought for me, says the Lord Jehovah. So this clearly states to us that Nebuchadnezzar's work at Tyre was a work of God. Now the one principle that should be coming through loud and clear here is that God will use pagan kings to fulfill his goals and accomplish his will. And just as he uses Satan and his demons to do the same thing. Now in verse 21, we see uh, this, this is the second oracle now ends in verse 21. And now this is dealing with the horn of Israel. In that day, I will cause a horn to bud forth onto the house of Israel. And I'll give you the opening of the mouth in the midst of them. And they shall know that I am Jehovah. Now, verse 21 is a clear reference to the Messiah. In that day, that means that when that final punishment of the Gentiles comes in the great tribulation, I will cause a horn to bud forth onto the house of Israel. So this describes Israel's full glory on the Messiah, the son of David, in his messianic kingdom. A horn symbolized strength, and we, we can find that in, in passages like 1 Samuel 2, verse 1, 1 Samuel 2, 1, 2 Samuel 22, 3. Uh, 1 Kings 22.11, 1 Kings 22.11. Yeah, so a horn symbolized strength, and it was now applied in an ultimate sense to the strength of the Messiah, Christ, who would deliver Israel. Now, uh, um, um, uh, Luke, uh, Luke 1.69, uh, Luke 169 says this, uh, and has raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David as he spake by the mouth of his holy prophets that have been from of old, salvation from your enemies and from the hand of all that hate us. So uh, concerning the Messiah, he will finally spring forth once God has finished with his judgments upon all the Gentile nations. Now that, of course, can only come uh, about during the Great Tribulation. Now concerning Ezekiel personally, Verse 21 says, I will give you the opening of the mouth in the midst of them. So his ceremonial dumbness is going to be removed. Now, this was already promised right back in, in chapter 24, verses 26 to 27. And it will be finally fulfilled when we get down to chapter 33, verse 22. And once again, the result will be, they shall know that I am Jehovah. Now, we come to the day of judgment upon Egypt in, in chapter 30, verses 1 to 19. And this is the third oracle. Uh, and it, it, no specific date is now given for it. But building upon what he has just said in, in chapter 29, verse 21, Ezekiel describes the day of Jehovah in verses 1 to 5 of chapter 30. Remember again that the, the, day, the phrase, the day of Jehovah, is the English translation of the most common Hebrew expression for the Great Tribulation. And that is a time when the Gentile nations will have their final judgment 
And it will be in that day when the horn of Israel will finally sprout forth. So let's look at it in verses 1 to 5. The word of Jehovah came again unto me, saying, Son of man, prophesy and say, Thus says the Lord Jehovah, Wail ye, alas, for the day. For the day is near, even the day of Jehovah is near. It shall be a day of clouds, a time of the nations. And a sword shall come upon Egypt, and anguish shall be in Ethiopia, when the slain shall fall in Egypt. And they shall take away her multitude, and her foundations shall be broken down. Ethiopia, and Put, and Lud, and all the mingled people, and Cub, and the children of the land that is in league, shall fall with them by the sword. So this third oracle we see in verses 1 to 19 deals with the day of Jehovah upon Egypt and especially how Egypt will be affected during the Great Tribulation. And these first five verses speak of the day of Jehovah itself. In verse 1, here we go, the word of Jehovah again appears with a new message. In verse 2, the announcement is made that the day is coming. Son of man, prophesy and say, thus says the Lord Jehovah. And Ezekiel is now told to proclaim two things. First, wail ye. That means go into deep mourning. Second, alas for the day. Now, in the context of Ezekiel's writings, when Ezekiel says the day, he means the same day which the other prophets spoke about, the day of Jehovah, the great tribulation. They all says the day. Now, having announced the coming of that great day, the day of the great tribulation in, in verse 3, he gives us a description of the great day of Jehovah, and he mentions three things. First, it's nearness. For the day is near, even the day of Jehovah is near. Emphasis here is that once the time for it has come, there'll be no delay in its execution. Second, it shall be a day of clouds. This emphasizes the darkness associated with the day of Jehovah. And this is a very common description of the tribulation by the prophets. Third, it will be a time of the nations. This means it's going to be the special time of judgment upon the Gentile nations in general. You know, we should uh, connect all of this going back to 29 verse 21. In that day will I cause a horn to bud forth unto the house of Israel. In other words, at the time when the Gentile nations receive their final judgment, then the Messianic kingdom is going to be firmly established at that time. It will be established upon the ruins of the kingdoms which culminated in the end of the times of the Gentiles. Now, the nations involved we see in verses 4 to 5. And he mentions some of them who are going to be involved here. And since in this context he's dealing primarily with Egypt, He'll be concerned exclusively with Egypt and her allies. Now, verse 4 deals specifically with Egypt. A sword shall come upon Egypt, and anguish shall be in Ethiopia. The anguish will be felt in Ethiopia because of the slain who are going to be going to fall in Egypt. As this happens, it will create a chain reaction down south in Ethiopia. And they shall take away her multitude. So the Egyptian population will suffer a massive destruction during the Great Tribulation, and her foundations shall be broken down. So the land of Egypt is to suffer the kind of desolation which will set the stage for the 40 years when it will be uninhabited. Now, verse 5 focus specifically upon the allies of Egypt, among whom Ezekiel mentions five, Ethiopia and Put, which is known as Somalia today, Lud, all the mingled people, which is a combination of nationalities all mixed together, also mentioned in Jeremiah uh, 25, verse 4, Jeremiah 25, verse 4, and Cub, C-U-B. Now, these five national groups are all in alliance with Egypt at the time. The children of the land that is in league are Egypt's mercenaries and confederates who will all fall by the sword. The picture here is of a massive destruction of the land of Egypt along with her allies. And this will lead in turn to the national salvation of Egypt described in Isaiah 19. 
Isaiah 19. But that in turn will also lead to the desolation of the land of Egypt for the first 40 years of the Messianic kingdom. Now we see the fall of, the, of, of Egypt and her allies in verses 6 to 9. Thus says Jehovah, they also that uphold Egypt shall fall. And the pride of her power shall come down from the tower of Sevena, shall they fall in it by the sword, saith the Lord Jehovah. And they shall be desolate in the midst of the countries that are desolate. And her cities shall be in the midst of the cities that are wasted. And they shall know that at, they shall know that I am Jehovah, when I have set a fire in Egypt, and all her helpers are destroyed. Verse 9. In that day shall messengers go forth from before me in ships to make the careless Ethiopians afraid. And there shall be anguish upon them as in the day of Egypt. For lo, it comes. So in verses 6 to 9, Ezekiel deals with the fall of Egypt and her allies. Verse 6 emphasizes the fall itself. Concerning her allies, he says, They also that upheld Egypt shall fall. These, of course, are the, the allies mentioned in the previous section. As for Egypt, he says, the pride of her power shall come down. This is a reference to Egypt's military might. The extent of her military defeat is from the Tower of Sevena, shall they fall in it by the sword. Again, um, verse 6 should be better translated the same as what we saw back in 29.10. Instead of the Tower of Sevena, it should read from Migdol, to Cien, from Migdol to Cien. The point, once again, is that this judgment will affect all of Egypt from north to south. Verse 7 emphasizes the desolation. They shall be desolate in the midst of the countries that are desolate. The point of the first line means that although other countries will be desolated, Egypt's desolation will be far more apparent. The second line, in the midst of the cities that are wasted, means that, the, that Egypt's cities will be so obviously wasted more than any other desolate cities. So it'll be particularly hard on Egypt. And the result of all of this is now seen in verse 8. The main outcome in verse 8 will be that they shall know that I am Jehovah. They will know who is God indeed. When will they know this? The timing and the means whereby it will come about is when I will set a fire in Egypt. Now, as far and as far as her allies are concerned, when all her allies are destroyed. So when this massive judgment comes upon Egypt and her allies, then they'll know for certain who it is that brought up all this about. It's the God of Israel. So in verse 9, there'll be a report. In that day, meaning the day when, when all this happens to Egypt, shall messengers go forth from before me in ships to make the careless Ethiopians afraid. When the Egyptians fall in Egypt and when the allies of Egypt fall in Egypt, then messengers will be sent to Ethiopia to let them know what has happened. And that will send a tremor of fear throughout the land of Ethiopia. Same thing is spoken about in Isaiah 18 verse 2. Isaiah 18, 2, where it also speaks about messengers being sent to the Ethiopians, to the careless Ethiopians. See, Ethiopia it would be so heavily dependent upon Egypt by that time. And when Egypt falls, there will naturally be anguish in Egypt. Sorry, that be anguish in Ethiopia, not Egypt. There will be already desolation there. So, there shall be anguish upon them as in the day of Egypt, for lo, it cometh. So what we see here is that as certain as the word of God is, the judgment day that is coming upon Egypt is just as certain. The ultimate fulfillment of all of this will be seen in the course of time. Now we see the destruction by the king of Babylon in verses 10 to 12. Thus says the Lord Jehovah, I'll also make the multitude of Egypt to cease by the hand of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon. He and his people with him, the terrible of the nations, shall be brought in to destroy the land, and they shall draw their swords against Egypt and fill the land with the slain. And I'll make the rivers dry and will sell the land into the hand of evil men. And I'll make the land desolate and all that is therein by the hand of strangers. 
I, Jehovah, have spoken it. Now in verses 10 to 12, he deals specifically with the destruction at the hand of the Babylonians. In verse 10, he emphasizes who the agent of destruction is. I will make Egypt's population to cease by the hand of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon. So clearly, Nebuchadnezzar is God's tool against Egypt as he was earlier against the city of Tyre. Notice that God, and again we see he uses unbelievers to carry out his purposes. And then in verse 11, he deals with the destruction. Again, the agent is he and his people with him. He is Nebuchadnezzar, and those who are with him are, of course, the Babylonians. The terrible of the nations, uh, as we've seen earlier on, this is a unique title for this king and the Babylonians. They're going to be brought in to destroy the land. Then the destruction is described. They shall draw their swords against Egypt. So this indicates here that Egypt is to fall by a military invasion. They shall fill the land with the slain. So by the time the Babylonians are through with the Egyptians, they'll be lying about dead everywhere. And then in verse 12, we're told what the results are going to be. I will make the rivers dry. For Egypt, this will be absolutely fatal. If Egypt's rivers die then Egypt dies with them. I will sell the land into the hand of evil men. This means that evil men who are not the least bit concerned about the Egyptians will now become rulers over them. I'll make the land desolate and all that is therein by the hand of strangers. And then we know that these strangers are the Babylonians. You see the judgment of the cities of Egypt in verses 13 to 19. Uh, I might have put a little bit of a table there for us. Thus says the Lord Jehovah, I will also destroy the idols and I'll cause the images to cease from Memphis. And there shall be no more a prince from the land of Egypt. And I'll put a fair in the land of Egypt. And I'll make Pathros desolate, will set a fire in Zoan, will execute judgments upon no, and I'll pour my wrath upon sin as a place, the stronghold of Egypt, and I'll cut off the multitude of no, and I'll set a fire in Egypt. Sin shall be in great anguish, and no shall be broken up, and Memphis shall have adversaries in the daytime. The young men of Avan and Pibethe shall fall by the sword, and these cities shall go into captivity. At Tehafnis, also, the day shall withdraw itself, when I shall break there the yokes of Egypt, and the pride of her power shall cease in her. As for her, a cloud shall cover her, and her daughters shall go into captivity. Thus will I execute judgments upon Egypt, and they shall know that I am Jehovah. So here in verses 30 to 19, this particular oracle ends with the judgment upon the cities of Egypt. In verse 13, with the first city he picks is Memphis. Uh, concerning this city, he mentions three things. First of all, there will be destruction of idolatry. I'll, I'll also I will also destroy the idols, and I'll cause the images to cease from Memphis. Now, uh, Memphis is also known as Nof, uh, N O P H, and it was the capital of Lower Egypt. It's about ten miles south of the modern day Cairo. Second, that we see the rulers of Memphis will be destroyed. There shall be no more a prince from the land of Egypt. A third, I'll put fear in the land of Egypt. So indeed, once Memphis, the capital of Lower Egypt, collapses, then the rest of Egypt does not have a whole lot of hope. And in the second part of verse 14, he turns to Pathros, which is in Upper Egypt. And concerning this city, he says, I will make Pathros desolate. Second part of verse 14, he turns to Zoan. I will set fire in Zoan. Now, Zoan is also known as Tanis. It is on the Nile Delta, and it was in the same area as Goshen. Now, Goshen were where the Jews settled during their sojourn in the land of Egypt. As a place, it's, it's mentioned in Numbers 13, verse 22. Numbers 13, 22. That's Zoan. 
In the last part of verse 14, he mentions no, which is N-O. I will execute judgments upon no. No was the capital of Upper Egypt. And its name was often combined with the name Ammon, who was a god of Egypt. So we, we'll, we see in Nahum 3, 8, it's listed as No Ammon. In Jeremiah 46, 25, it is called Ammon of No. It's Greek, it's Greek, its Greek name was Thebes. Probably better named by this name today than any other. Thebes, T-H-E-B-E-S. First part of verse 15, it turns to another city called Sin. I'll put my wrath upon Sin. This city is, is known as Pelusium. It is a stronghold of Egypt, meaning it was a border city on the northeast frontier, about 23 miles south of the modern Port Said. Second part of verse 15, he again turns back to no, and he says, I'll cut off the multitude of no. Now, whereas before uh, the emphasis was on the destruction of the city of no, now the emphasis is on the destruction of the population of no. And then in the first part of verse 16, concerning Egypt, he says, I will set a fire in Egypt. And then in the second part of verse 16, he, he again turns to sin, and he says, sin shall be in great anguish. Now, having said that, he turns again to no and says, and no shall be broken up. And then in the last part of verse 16, he focuses on Memphis again and says, Memphis shall have adversaries in the daytime. In verse 17, he talks about Aven and P. Beth Bethes. The young men shall fall by the sword. Now, Aven was also known as Beth Shemesh. Uh, that's his Hebrew name. It's also named by the Greek name Heliopolis. Heliopolis. Both the Hebrew and Greek names means the house of the sun or the city of the sun. Um, it's located about seven miles north of modern day Cairo. And it's also mentioned in uh, Jeremiah 43, verse 13. Uh, and that's that's Avon. Second city mentioned is P. Bethes, known as Bubastis also. It was the guardian city of a cat-shaped idol. Now, cats were therefore uh, considered to be sacred and holy in this city. And it was here that cats were actually mummified. It's located about 35 miles northeast of Cairo. In verse 18, he mentions Tehaphnes. The city is known by its Greek name of Daphne. It was one of Pharaoh's royal residences, according to Jeremiah 2 verse 16, Jeremiah 2 16 and Jeremiah 43 verse 9. Now, many of the Jews who fled to Egypt after the fall of Jerusalem at the hands of the Babylonians and after the execution of Gedaliah settled in this city, according to Jeremiah 43 verse 7. This is the city of Tehaphnes or, or Daphne. It's also known as Hamis, and that is what Isaiah calls it in Isaiah 30 verse 4. Isaiah 30 verse 4. It's called Hames, H-A-M-E-S. It's southwest of Pelusium. Now concerning uh, Tehaphnes, he says, the day shall withdraw itself. And now that, that's a figure of speech for utter despair. The time when this city will experience utter dis despair is when I shall break there the yokes of Egypt and the pride of her power shall cease in her. For as for her, a cloud shall cover her and her daughters shall go into captivity so the picture here is that uh, the population of both Tehaphnes and its suburbs are going to go into captivity and in verse 19 he spells out the results thus will i execute judgments upon egypt and they shall know that i am jehovah and with that the third or third of the oracles concerning egypt now comes to an end in verses 20 to 26, we're going to see the dispersion of the Egyptians. Verse 20 gives us the date. It came to pass in the 11th year, in the first month, in the seventh day of the month. The word of Jehovah came unto me, saying, 11th year would be 587 BC. The first month would be Nisan, which is around March, April of our calendar. So the word of Jehovah came to Zechariah on the seventh day of Nisan. Je not, Ze not Zechariah. Um, Ezekiel, on the seventh day of Nisan, 587 BC. It was in the second year of the siege of Jerusalem and five months before its destruction. And remember, it was destroyed in 586 BC. It's also about three months since the prophecy against Pharaoh back in 29 verse 1. 
In verses 21 to 26, he begins to deal with the judgment itself. Son of man, I have broken the arm of Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and lo, it hath not been bound up to apply healing medicines, to put a bandage to bind it, that it be strong to hold the sword. Therefore, thus says the Lord Jehovah, Behold, I am against Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and I will break, I, and will break his arms, the strong arm, and that which was broken. And I'll cause the sword to fall out of his hand. And I'll scatter the Egyptians among the nations and will disperse them through the countries. And I will strengthen the arms of the king of Babylon and put my sword in his hand. But I will break the arms of Pharaoh and he shall groan before him with the groanings of a deadly wounded man. Verse 25. And I'll hold up the arms of the king of Babylon and the arms of Pharaoh shall fall down. And they shall know that I am Jehovah when I shall put my sword into the hand of the king of Babylon, and he shall stretch it out upon the land of Egypt. And I'll scatter the Egyptians among the nations and disperse them through the countries, and they shall know that I am Jehovah. Now in verse 21, the emphasis is on the fact that Pharaoh is broken. I have broken the arm of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. Now this is the play upon words here, right? Because Pharaoh, Hophra, Hophra, uh, he was the Pharaoh in, in, in power at this time. Hophra, the name means possessed of a muscular man or possessed of a, or a strong armed man. Now, this strong armed man has his arm broken. This may be a takeoff of the defeat of Hophra, who was defeated by Nebuchadnezzar in 588 BC, about a year earlier. This is when he came down to uh, give Judah a hand. He says that his defeat is going to prove fatal because it's, he says, Lo, it hath not been bound up. There has been no application of healing medicine. No bandage has been put around his arm. He's been so badly wounded that he's now completely incapable of holding a sword in his hand. His sword arm, with which he has fought his battles in the past, has now been broken. But that's not all, because it's not, God is not finished with him yet. There's more to come. In verse 22, we now have a declaration of further judgment against him. Therefore, thus says the Lord Jehovah, or in light of the background of verse 21, his defeat at the hands of Nebuchadnezzar a, a year earlier, here we go. He said, I will break his arms. Again, we have a play upon the meaning of his name. The strong arm, meaning the good one that was not broken previously. Now, in this case, it would be a reference to the rest of his army and that which was broken. So his main arm had been broken in verse 21. The bulk of his army had suffered defeat, and now the rest of them will experience defeat as well. And I will cause a sword to fall out of his hand. So the picture here is one of total defeat. Earlier, while he still had his regular fighting arm, that was broken so that he could no longer hold a sword. Now he's trying to use his other arm, which was the only one he could now use. This one is also broken, and the sword falls out of that hand. So not able to use either hand, the whole emphasis here is on total and utter defeat. In verse 23, he deals with the judgment upon Egypt. I will scatter the Egyptians among the nations. It's obvious here that the prophecy of this verse goes beyond the defeat of Pharaoh Hophra by Nebuchadnezzar. Uh, as we said back in uh, uh, chapter 29, verses 8 to 12, uh, although the, the text itself seems to draw a distinction between Pharaoh on the one hand and then the Egyptians on the other hand, and then it speaks of Pharaoh. In this case, it would be Pharaoh Hophra. So these prophecies concerning him have been fulfilled. But this worldwide dispersion of the Egyptians did not occur at the time when Hophra was defeated. So whilst the prophecies concerning Pharaoh Hophra have already been fulfilled, the prophecies concerning the dispersion of the Egyptians have not been fulfilled. So, so Dr. Fruchtenbaum would say that this dispersion spoken of here in verse 23 would be the same as that back in 29 verses 8 to 12. Now in verse 24, he again turns back to Pharaoh and talks about his fall. I will strengthen the arms of the king of Babylon and put my sword in his hand. So in this passage, God says he's going to take his own sword and put it into the hand of Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon. Now here again, 
uh, uh, God is playing games with a very common Egyptian symbol that is found in their paintings and inscriptions where a God is depicted as giving a sword to the Pharaoh. This symbol is commonly found in their literature and paintings. And what it, what it means is, is to denote or to picture the source of their king's strength. It came from the God giving the king his own sword. So uh, taking this very common figure from ancient Egyptian literature and sculpture, what is very obviously happening here is that God is giving his sword, not to Pharaoh, king of Egypt, but to the king of Babylon. And since God is the source of the king of Babylon's strength in the battle, the Egyptians are certain to be defeated. He says, I will break the arms of Pharaoh. That's uh, that's a bit of a summary statement of what has already been said back in verse 22. He goes on to say, he shall groan before him with the groanings of a deadly wounded man. Now, if this is purely prophetic, it may be the same as what is recorded back in, in Daniel chapter 11, verse 40 and 42 and 43. Daniel 11, 40, 42 and 43. But, but again here, as far as it is dealing with Pharaoh, then it has been fulfilled in the defeat of Hophra by the king of Babylon. But in so far as it's talking about the dispersion of the Egyptians, that hasn't been fulfilled yet. That's still to be fulfilled. In verses 25 to 26, we read of the results of what's going to happen. Now, these are broken down so that we have one for Pharaoh and one for the Egyptians. The result for Pharaoh is recorded in uh, verse 25 and comprises three things. First of all, I will hold up the arms of the king of Babylon. Now, if you go back into Exodus 17, verse 11, uh, there we found that uh, the arms of Moses were held up uh, right in the, in the battle. Uh, and, and when the holding up of the arms of Moses meant the defeat of the Amalekites. So the holding up of the arms of the king of Babylon means that Egypt is going to be defeated and Babylon will have total victory. So the first result we see here is the guarantee of victory for the Babylonians. The second thing we see is that the arms of Pharaoh shall fall down. So the king of Babylon's hands are lifted up, but the arms of Pharaoh have fallen down. This pictures the defeat of Pharaoh to the point where he'll have no more victories. He has won his last battle. The third thing we see is they shall know that I am Jehovah. They'll know who is God indeed when I shall put my sword into the hand of the king of Babylon. Notice again the expression here, my sword. This is God's sword indicating the king of Babylon is doing the work of God in the land of Egypt, as he had done earlier, the work of God against the city of Tyre. He shall stretch it out upon the land of Egypt. So Egypt will be conquered and will become part of the Babylonian empire. And that will be the result for Pharaoh. In verse 26, he deals with the results for the Egyptians. First, I will scatter the Egyptians among the nations. Second, I will disperse them through the countries. Third, they shall know that I am Jehovah. Again, what was spoken of Pharaoh personally, uh, this has already been fulfilled. But what is said here about the Egyptians has yet to be fulfilled. Now, this concludes the fourth oracle. Now, we move on to the fifth of the seven oracles against Egypt. Here we have the... Um, the comparison of Egypt with Assyria. The date is, uh, we see in, in, in chapter 31, verse 1, it came to pass in the 11th year, in the third month, in the first day of the month, that the word of Jehovah came unto me, saying. So the 11th year uh, covers 587, 586 BC. Third month is, is Sivan, which falls around May, June of our calendar. Now, this prophecy came on the first day of the month. So this prophecy came to Ezekiel on the 1st of Sivan, 587 BC, in the month of June. So about three months. This is about just about three months before Jerusalem was destroyed. And it's two months, less six days, almost two months, after the prophecy of chapter 30, verse 20. Ezekiel provides a date in chapter 31, 
verse 2 to 19, where he describes the day of the tree of Assyria. Son of man, say unto Pharaoh, a king of Egypt, and to his multitude, this is verses 2 to 9, unto his multitude, whom art thou like in thy greatness? Behold, the Assyrian was a cedar in Lebanon with fair branches and with a forest-like shade and of high stature, and its top was among the thick boughs. The waters nourished it, the deep made it to grow. The rivers thereof ran round about its plantation, and it sent out its channels onto all the trees of the field. Therefore its stature was exalted above all the trees of the field, and its boughs were multiplied, and its branches became long by reason of many waters when it shot them forth. All the birds of the heavens made their nests in its boughs, and under its branches did all the beasts of the field bring forth their young, and under its shadow dwelt all great nations. Thus was it fair in its greatness, the length of its branches, for its root was by many waters. Verse 8. The cedars in the garden of God could not hide it. The fir trees were not like its boughs, and the plane trees were not as its branches. Nor was any tree in the garden of God like unto it in its beauty. I made it fair by the multitude of its branches, so that all the trees of Eden that were in the garden of God envied it. So now, as he begins dealing with the comparison of Egypt to Assyria in verse 2 to 9, he describes the tree of Assyria. In verse 2, we find out who is being addressed here. Son of man, say unto the king of Egypt and to his multitude. So the king of Egypt is, is the Pharaoh, of course. The multitude is the Egyptian people in general, and perhaps the Egyptian, Egyptian army in particular. And he asks a question. Whom art thou like in thy greatness? Obviously, uh, Egypt thought she was in a class by herself. It's a question of comparison here. Who is Egypt to be compared with? The answer will prove to be Assyria. So Egypt can be compared with Assyria for greatness. Now, Assyria would have had great significance to Egypt for two reasons. First of all, Assyria had been the only Mesopotamian nation to invade Egypt. In 633 BC, Assyria had entered Egypt and destroyed the capital of Thebes. Uh, we see that in Nahum uh, 3, verses 8 to 10. Nahum 3, 8 to 10. So the only nation that could be compared with Egypt was Assyria. Second, Assyria had been destroyed by Babylon, the same nation Ezekiel said would now enter into Egypt and destroy it. And in verse 3, he describes Assyria as a great cedar tree. Behold, the Assyrian was a cedar in Lebanon with fair branches and with a forest-like shade and of high stature and its top was among the thick boughs. This is a, a lofty cedar is also pictured uh, as depicted as the leaders of Israel back in Ezekiel 17. Ezekiel 17. But the emphasis in this verse is on the greatness, the might and the power of the Assyrian Empire. At the apex of her power, Assyria dominated the Middle East. Then verse 4 tells us how well situated this tree was. First, the waters nourished it. Second, the deep made it to grow. Third, the rivers thereof ran round about its plantation. Fourth, it sent out its channels onto all the trees of the field. So we see uh, several different water sources here. Uh, and the emphasis here is on a continuous supply of nourishment. So this cedar tree appeared to be eternal. Now, verse 5 speaks of its exaltation. Therefore, because of what is said in verse 4, first of all, its stature was exalted above all the trees of the field. Second, its boughs were multiplied. And third, its branches became long by reason of many waters when it shot them forth. So the emphasis in verse 4 was on the continuous supply of nourishment, giving it the appearance of permanence. Now, it's clear that Assyria had all of the natural recourses or resources it needed to build up its tremendous army. The emphasis in verse 5 is on Assyria's superiority over other nations. Because of all its natural resources, it was able to expand and achieve tremendous power and authority to give it superiority over other nations. 
Then verse 6 describes its influence. All the birds of the heavens made their nests in its boughs. It's the first thing. Second, under its branches did all the beasts of the field bring forth their young. And third, under its shadow dwelt all great nations. So the emphasis here is on Assyria's influence and control over all the other nations. Now, having given this description in verse 7, we have a summary of verses 3 to 6. First, thus was it fair in its greatness. That summarizes verse 3. Second, in the length of its branches. That summarizes verse 5. And third, for its root was by many waters. That's the summary of verse 4. Then in verses 8 to 9, we have a comparison of this cedar tree with the other trees of Eden, the garden of God. In verse 8, he gives an actual comparison with the other trees in the garden of God. Now, in this comparison, he says, first, the cedars could not hide it. Second, as for their fir trees, they were not like its boughs. Third, concerning the plane trees, they were not as its branches. Indeed, a nor Indeed, he says, nor was there any tree in the garden of God like unto it in its beauty. So what we, the emphasis we see here in verse 8 is on the uniqueness of the glory of Assyria. No matter what amount of glory the other trees may have displayed, the glory of Assyria eclipsed them. It was, it, Assyria's glory was, ab was absolutely unique. And this comparison with the other trees in verse 8 led to the envy of the other trees in verse 9. I made it fair by the multitude of its branches. In other words, the Assyrian Empire was a work of God. He said, I made, he said, I made it fair by the multitude of its branches. Now, although the Assyrians would not have known this, yet it was the God of Israel who had brought them to this very high position of prominence among the nations. And it was brought to the extent that all the trees of Eden that were in the garden of God envied it. One of the reasons why Ezekiel connects Eden, the garden of God, with Assyria, if you remember, is because Eden was in the territory that later became Assyria. And if you read Genesis chapter 2, verses 10 to 14, you'll see that. The Eden of Genesis chapters 2 to 3 was in that part of the world that was later covered by the Assyrian Empire. So this was the special connection with this cedar tree. Uh, and this is the connection that it had here and what made it unique among all the other trees. In Assyria's former exalted position, she had attained power and influence that far exceeded Egypt's. She was the perfect example to show Egypt the effects of God's judgment. And that is where we're gonna leave it for this session. Thank you for coming along. Study hard and grow strong.